Now to the rest of the stories. A former Nigerian finance minister, Dr. Kalo Idika Kalo, now joins me for a discussion on the economic impact of COVID-19 and, more importantly, what should Nigeria uh, be preparing to do after the pandemic? Uh, thank you so much for joining us, uh, Dr. Kalo Idika Kalo. Uh, let's begin with uh, that targeting a, a discrete time frame that you uh, talk about in uh, responding to the shocks of uh, this uh, COVID-19 pandemic and, of course, the fall in oil price uh, that, unfortunately, is Nigeria's only source of income. Uh, help us understand this. Well, as uh, the last speaker said, you know, we, we needed to do so many things before it got to this stage. Well, that applies to just about every other country, from China, the U.S., and the rest of it. Now, this thing has posed such a tremendous problem. In fact, this event is like uh, taking a still picture of the entire society to show where it stands with respect to whether you talk about uh, food or education or health and things of this sort. Now, the notion of a discrete time is that you get a sense that with all the opera around the whole world, every responsible authority, from the federal to the state to the local, have to make sure that they now provide palliatives to ensure that we don't have a massive starvation, people dying in various parts of the country. Nigeria is a large country. Now, uh, the whole world stands in trepidation to see if what has happened in places like uh, Italy, Spain, the United States, and of course, China will replicate itself in the large countries of India, Bangladesh, uh, Brazil, Indonesia, and of course, Nigeria. These are very large populations. So while we await the potential for cure, while we await the extensive work that is do being done on vaccines, question of isolation has been said. The individual to do what he needs to do, the co communities, families, and so on, then this is the only approach. But for you to do that in a, a less developed countries like Nigeria, where not everybody has access to power, not everybody has refrigeration, so that if they have the resources, they can even procure and store. So the logistics of saying within, say, two to three months time span, it's like we should, everything must hold while we mobilize the resources to make sure that we're able to mobilize material and cash to all our people, to the extent that it's possible. You can't possibly meet the needs of everybody. You can see what's happening in the States. Billions and billions being voted every other week as it were. But at least at the federal level, at the state level, at the local government level, and also allowing for contributions from the private sector, NGOs, corporate and non-corporate individuals, and so on and so forth. This has to be explicitly planned for. And I think if we take a time frame like two or three months, hopefully within that time frame, there will be a distinct change in the efforts now being made to make sure that we begin to cure this, uh, this amazing uh, pandemic. So that's what I meant by, 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 um, by a discrete time frame. We have mm. to decide. It will definitely be more than a month, but maybe it will be too much to go beyond three months, just in terms of the shared logistics that will be involved in mobilizing enough resources, putting it on, on, uh, on ground, the structure, which will involve our officials from the highest level to the local government, traditional rulers, uh, NGOs, as I said, community leaders, to make sure that we do not starve our people. Okay. We have and, the resources. Uh, of, of course, the, the UN, if I may uh, quickly, if I may come in so that we can maximize the time, the UN has actually raised uh, the alarm of a possible famine uh, post-COVID-19. Now, let's talk about uh, some of the measures that the Nigerian government has been trying to put in place uh, to mitigate the economic uh, effects of uh, COVID-19. Uh, there has been uh, the issue of a budget cut from, you know, $35 billion uh, downwards by uh, about 15%, and also a cut in oil production from 2.5 or so to 1.7, and all other measures that the CBN, the central bank, has actually also put in place, some 1.1 trillion naira 
into the economy. Uh, from your standpoint, would you say that uh, these measures are enough uh, to, you know, stave off what we fear the most, famine and economic downturn? And the, the uh, finance minister, Zainab Ahmed, had actually said that if this COVID thing continues for the next six months, Nigeria will indeed go into a recession. Well, well the question of going to a recession is almost trivial in our circumstances. You can see what the, the World Bank and the IMF are projecting for the even more advanced countries. So we should even leave out all these fine terms about recession and so on and so forth. And might I add that it is not just a matter of talking in terms of so much percentage of GDP or so many trillions of billions. We have to start from estimates with people, with communities. What is the size of the people we are talking about? Suppose what we are looking at is like, perhaps only 20% of our population can take care of themselves. So we are talking about four-fifths of the entire population of 200 million. You know what that means? Mm -hmm. So it's a lot of people. So we start from numbers of people, from where they live, the communities, and then we scale up in terms of what they require to sustain themselves on a daily, weekly, or monthly basis. That way we can come up with a figure. Of course, if it is too horrendous, then we start to cut back from there. So we can't start to even evaluate in terms of it being enough or not by just looking at uh, uh, as it were paper money, whether in dollar terms or in narrow terms. Mm. So these are the kinds of work that we should have done. You look at cities, you look at communities, you look at villages. Of course, it's not the federal government that will go down and do all this. That's what the local governments are there for. So quickly, they, they can only come up with their best estimates of, suppose we had to provide for 80%, say, of their people, what would be required? From there, we can determine the amount of money required. But I can say off the cuff that whatever we have done now is commendable, but there is no way we can talk about it being enough, particularly when it is envisaged that we are really just at the starting stage of mm -hmm. this thing. Hopefully, we don't have to go through what Italy, Spain, and uh, Korea and all these other countries have gone through. So and in terms of more sustainable, in, in terms of more sustainable measures, uh, Nigeria is uh, now seeking emergency funds of up to seven uh, billion dollars from international lenders like IMF, World Bank, uh, even the African Development Bank, and the rest of them. Uh, well, would you say that look, it's enough to just throw money at these uh, issues that you know face us? What, what's your, you know, thinking? Is it really about getting more funds uh, to meet these challenges? Or do we need the more critical uh, thing in terms of right thinking uh, by the leaders and all those who are in position to decide on what to do or what not to do? Well, you, you heard about the discussions in the United States that we should set politics aside. As I have just said, we, we could by now have started with the estimates of how many people will stand to benefit. So it's not about throwing money. When you've got the, the quantities, the number of people you're talking about, that gives you an estimate of the resources that you need. Grains, staples, oil, meat, so on and so forth. So that the question of throwing money will be out of it because now you are now going to be looking at your requirements in financial terms based on what you've already determined in quantitative terms. That is the way to go. And as I said, we should set aside all these artificial boundaries, north, west, east, south, Christian, Muslim, and the rest of it. COVID does not respect any of these uh, distinctions. So we should have a national leadership, the president, the senators, the governors, the reps at, level, at the federal and state, the councillors, the traditional rulers, the professional groups, and so on and so forth. If you map out a strategy, they can sit down and quickly come up with what okay. you might call a back of the envelope estimate. And that's a very good way to start. Yes, you don't start with the money. You start with what you need. And from there, you can have some estimate. And before I leave the question of money, of course, you know, that is the, the mandate of the UN uh, financial institutions like the IMF and the World Bank, and of course, the ADB, Asian Development Bank. When they see the problem coming, they use all their might to mobilize the resources to assist their member countries. So we should have no qualms about doing that. And we are going to go more than that because it will never be enough. We have to mobilize our own resources, adjust our own revenues, cut our budgets, as I suggested, any un unusable 
purposes and so on. All this should be caught within this discrete time frame so that we are mobilizing maximally to meet the estimates that we have come up with. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Kalu Kalu many times the Minister of the Federal Republic, Finance and Transport, uh, as well as other things. <laughs>